I am Flavia Berliani Zimmerman from the Australian Institute of International Affairs and today we have with us uh, Professor Jackie Drew and Dr. Maria Pena from Monash University and we will be discussing feminist theory and international relations. Um, if the two of you could uh, give some reflections on feminist theory and the field of international relations. Well, I think because we're just coming off from uh, an amazing um, um, discussion with Cynthia Enlow, I think the important contribution is really um, building on that personal is political, is international, and she's really strong on that. And feminists all over the world have been trying to piece those connections together and that by starting from these um, micro level practices, we are able to construct the structures and the cultures in place that create various relationships of power and of domination and subordination. Mm. That's great, and I, I really agree. I, I, I've always thought that what's really distinctive about a feminist perspective on international relations is its methodology. And its methodology is that it kind of starts from the particular located observation and tries to then understand the patterns of international relations. So think, for example, Cynthia Enlow is obviously famous for looking at the Nike shoe mm -hmm. and trying to understand, you know, the production relations in Indonesia, you know, and the, and the struggles on the factory floor with, with the Nike Corporation um, and the gendered politics of that, you know, who, who makes the shoe, who produces the shoe, who receives the benefit from the shoe. Um, who wears the shoe. Mm. Um, so it's that kind of method of linking the micro and the macro, mm. um, the, as Maria said, the personal and the international. And what that does is really open up a whole range of new topics in international relations, a whole range of different ways of understanding relationships um, and the ways in which they are uh, you know, shaped uh, and uh, you know, expand across a number of different spaces, scales uh, and levels. Right. And, and if I may add to that, it's just also broadening that expertise and knowledge base even further because, um, again, the kind of work that feminists have been doing is really seeing um, the diversity of experiences, uh, the similarities and differences with the global north and the global south and the connections between those, with what are occurring in the households in Philippines, with the households in Indonesia, for instance, and seeing those continuities. Um, these are all very feminist and inspired inquiries and, and, and that expertise, like more people can, can contribute and more voices can be heard and have a say on what is happening and, and, and that's a space of politics. Yeah. Thank you very mm. much. And uh, can, I, can I maybe continue that, that point? Because <laughs> this afternoon I'm on a panel about what yeah. is you know, international relations theory and how do we, how do we theorize. Um, you know, and so it's going to have a lot of different perspectives and, and not just feminist perspectives, but I think the point Maria makes that, um, and the point that Cynthia Enlow makes is um, that you know, everyone is a theorist actually. Mm. There are many theorists yes. who are activists who are practicing their theory. They might not write about it in scholarly journals, but they have um, mm. a particular understanding that informs their, their practice. And so I think that really, um, in order to understand international relations, we have to appreciate the perspectives and theories of different, differently situated people. And for feminists, then, what's really important in the work we do is that, is that we engage with, we collaborate with, we talk with, we don't just uh, research other people, but we actually engage, engage those Great theories. Dialogues. We ask them to help yeah. us build and test our theories. Um, to make them more valid, reliable, credible and legitimate. Mm, thank you. And how do the two of you think that uh, feminist perspectives might be used in the field of international relations in the global north and the global south? Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, an interesting um, example would be on the paper that I presented in the panel that um, Jackie and a few other scholars are in um, just the other day and we're talking about um, the relationship in, between gender and, and the kind of leaderships in, in foreign policy or um, in, in, in high level um, peace and conflict negotiations for instance and I'm, I've, I've, I've talked about how Duterte, and much like what um, Cynthia and Lowe is talking about when we look at Trump, these are um, figureheads but they are part of a broader pattern and our task whether 
feminist or non-feminist, whether you, you identify as one. But the task before us to understand how specific forms of, of, of posturing and rhetoric are moving towards that hyper-masculine domination, militarized aggression. And it is re, 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 uh, reproducing certain types of, of relationships at the very low, low level. And, and that, that means that, you know, there is, on one hand, there are different contextualized ways by which masculinities and femininities are being defined. Um, certainly the context in the Philippines is very different in, in the U.S., but both countries have uh, Trump and a Duterte, and in other parts as well, there are similar, um, you know, increase in, in strong men, um, macho style of leadership, and that begs an inquiry of, what then is the bigger picture that we need to be looking at? Why are there a resurgence of these type of, of hypermasculine um, militarized aggression occurring? And, the, and, and one um, piece of the puzzle, following again Cynthia Enloe's metaphor, could be that we are at a, uh, at a point where there's growing insecurity at various levels, from communities to state and, and global and regional insecurities, from um, you know, ongoing economic crises, political crises, health crises, mm -hmm. climate change and disasters. It's, it's a different environment, and perhaps that is one clue, but there are other, way, other clues that we can look at on why we're seeing this pattern between the global north and the global south. Mm -hmm. I mean, just to add to what Maria's said, um, I think um, feminist theorists are, of international relations when they look at security, for example, they always ask through whose identity do we seek security? Mm -hmm. And I guess what Maria is saying is that often when we look to seek security and to feel secure, we think that a strong, masculine, mm -hmm. authoritarian leader can provide yeah. that security. So noticing that tells us, you know, through a gender lens, tells us something very important about international relations and about international security. Um, I think as well as leadership though, what, what's yeah. really interesting is to look at the policy making level mm -hmm. and to look at our institutions and to note this paradox that on the one hand, exactly as Maria says, we have these kind of uh, you know, hyper-masculinized leaders who are performing actually quite, you know, uh, you know we, we might say quite neolithic type gender roles in some cases, definitely infantil infantilizing gender roles in some ways. Um, but on the other hand, we actually have states now, like Sweden yes. and like Canada, who are explicitly adopting and, mm -hmm. and, and speaking out as, you know, as having feminist uh, foreign policies mm -hmm. or international assistance policies and feminist governments, um, and obviously having quite distinct understandings of what feminism means. But nonetheless, that's a real paradox mm -hmm. to have both these hyper-masculine yes. leaders and these very pro-feminist states mm, yeah. and institutions and I suppose it's, it, that that has made gender issues so much more visible in global politics mm. than ever before I mean they've always been significant and fortunately we've had wonderful scholars thinkers like Cynthia Enloe to kind of make visible um, gender and show how gender makes the world go round but now that we actually have governments stating strong commitments mm. to the promotion of gender equality uh, and women's empowerment through their foreign policies, through their defence policies. Mm. I mean, that you know gives us a reason to say, okay, well, what does that mean, and what does that look like, and what do they do in practice? And then, what happens when you have a pro-feminist state encountering a hyper-masculine leader? Mm. So, for example, the case of Sweden and Putin, uh, or even in the context of Australia, how do how do what happens when you have a very pro uh, pro-gender equality minister, for example, of foreign affairs, and a pretty ultra-conservative minister of home affairs and border control. Yeah, so how does that play out? And how, does, how far and in what ways does that reflect the tensions in gender relations mm. within our societies? Mm, fascinating, thank you. So just wrapping up our interview, um, if the two of you could give some reflections of the condition of women in the Philippines. I think First, that's a very broad <laughs> question. It's like, um, I think, and again, building on the, the, the research that I've just started doing in, in terms of really taking seriously um, the, the broader processes that are 
reflected by the leadership of the Teete and the response to to uh, and the, str the str strong support that he he has in the Philippines, I think it raises to my attention, to my feminist curiosity, two things: is that um, and this builds on what Jackie was saying as well that gender equality is still rife with contestations and, 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 and that it is something that is an ongoing process of negotiation, of, uh, of two steps forward and perhaps three steps back. It's, it is, in a way, something that we should be looking at with greater scrutiny, the kind of uh, reversals and contestations. And, and, and Duterte and Trump are just one of those things that um, are, are, are drawing our attention to and in particular because the Philippines has got very good gender equality laws mm -hmm. and and for the longest time it has been among the top 10 countries which have in many indicators bridged the gender um, uh, gender global gender gaps um, and yet you have all these other issues that uh, gender equality issues that are ongoing and and in some ways are being taken for granted such as for instance that it is the last country without divorce and, and that there are ongoing restrictions to accessing contraception in that country, for instance. Um, and the second thing is that I think, in, in, in my case, is to really create a disaggregated analysis of women's movements and really take uh, seriously the kind of strategies and alliance building that women's movements are doing deliberately in response to a, an ever-shrinking democratic space fueled by authoritarian or strong strong uh, hypermasculine leadership and that's occurring in Philippines um, at a very low level and, 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 and we're seeing similarities in across Southeast Asia. Thank you. Well I might say just a little bit about Philippines not being an expert on it but having worked with Maria and, um, and next week I'm about to go to a conference in which I noticed in Manila which I noticed that Duterte is kind of the, on the, the giving the keynote right right next to my panel or in the same conference. So I'm, I may have to be careful about what I wear to that conference. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, I think what's really fascinating about Duterte, and it's a point Maria makes about you know, how hypermasculine leaders create crises in order to you know, kind of have, have an opportunity demise, yeah. to, to, be a, to, to have a strong arm approach and to, to kind of bolster their, their popularity and their, and their legitimacy. And this is what Duterte has done in the context of the Marawi siege uh, uh, and the, the ISIS-associated uh, militants there um, in allowing martial law to be continued well mm. beyond that crisis. Yeah. Um, and I think that's very interesting because uh, countering violent extremism and counterterrorism has you know, been very much part of his narrative and his justification mm. uh, for mil militarism. Um, and what's really interesting in that context is, is to see is, that, is to see exactly as Maria said the the kind of the, the kind of the, the local knowledge and the local resistance to kind of heavily militarized countering violent extremism responses mm -hmm. and how they uh, might not not only not be effective mm -hmm. uh, in addressing the root causes of violent extremism, um, but how they actually fail to recognize the significant knowledge. Uh, mm. talents and abilities uh, to be able to prevent and, and uh, prevent violent extremism, to, prevent, to, to notice the warning signs of violent extremism mm. um, and to be able to uh, build peace in communities um, that we see among women and, and women-led civil society organisations and that's exactly the case in Marawi. Many women in those communities notice the early warning signs of the militants of the ISIS-linked militants, they tried to report it to local government and they were ignored, mm -hmm. sent away. So there's a real failed opportunity mm. there and unfortunately what happens when you have a highly militarised approach to the problem mm. is you're always going to fail to see mm. the, mm. the alternatives yeah. Yeah. to that and you're not actually going to be able to prevent violence or prevent extremism. Mm. So I think, you know, there, I mean, linking feminist analysis and method to the kind of theorists and the voices who are actually actively working on the ground to counter violence is so important um, if we're going to achieve our goal of uh, peace and security uh, on an international scale. Thank you very much for being first, Jackie. Great, great to be with you. Thank you for being first, Maria. Thank you, Fabia. It's a pleasure to be here and thank you to pe people who are watching this. <laughs> so, uh, for more information, please visit our website www.internationalaffairs.org.au. Thank you.